Okay, all right, go ahead and put me on. Tell me when, give me the thumbs up when, when, I'm, when I'm on, girl. Sometimes I, okay. Oh, hi. Um, good evening tonight. Well, we welcome you here in beautiful Anchorage, Alaska. This is Freedom Night. It is truly my favorite night of the week. Um, this place has a lot of fond memories for me. And we welcome you here because tonight we're going to be teaching. I'm going to be the, have the honor of teaching out of the Biblical Foundations of Freedom. And tonight we're going to be teaching on bitterness, or better known as unforgiveness. So I'm going to open us in prayer, and then we're going to get started tonight. Father God, we love you, and we thank you, Father, for your truth and your ways that... Um, that you want us to cultivate in our heart, that you want us to grow and water and practice, Father, to live a life in forgiveness and repentance. And Father, I thank you so much for that. And Lord, we um, ask you, Father, to come, and we thank you for the opportunity to gather together in your presence and with one another with believers, Father, that want to live um, your ways. And Lord, I thank you so much for that. Father, we set this time aside for you, and we ask, Father God, that, Holy, that you would come, Holy Spirit, you, and open the eyes of our heart to hear you, to understand you in a new way. And we bind the accuser in any way that he wants to wreck, try to wreak havoc, unbelief or fear in this session and we set this time and set for you aside for you and we ask this in Yeshua's mighty name amen amen all right okay so tonight we're going to get started on chapter five and it is on bitterness so we are, have already moved into our fifth chapter so I'm just going to do a quick review but what I want to say is this is the month of February and this really is one of my favorite months of the year because as I was younger and a, a teacher here in the district, it was, we celebrated uh, Valentine's and I, and I love love. And I love celebrating about love. Well, 10 years ago, actually in this month, is when I had the diagnosis of cancer in my body. And it was 10 years ago that I went through that journey. And God completely rocked my world. He showed me a complete new way of living and responding and handling life in a journey that I didn't want to be in. It was a journey that was um, not always fun, but the journey uh, set me free. And what I wanted at the end of my journey was I wanted to say that I represented my God well. And that's what I wanted. And so that was my mission, that was my vision, and that was my goal. So I came here through the doors 10 years ago, um, three months before that diagnosis, because my adult child, one of my adult children was struggling in addiction. And I cannot tell you how thankful I am that I came, because I learned how to love um, um, my family members. I learned how to respond to them God's way and not my way. I learned how to um, understand, completely understand that we do have an adversary. His name is Satan, and he does come to still kill and destroy, and that he was after my life and he was after my family. And I stood up and I said, no, 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 it's not going to happen. And I am, um, have been cancer-free for 10 years, and so I'm here to celebrate that tonight. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that. Um, um, if, uh, if you guys have any questions about that later on, we have people here in the audience, and so if you have questions about that, I would love to share it with you. Um, anybody who is online, stay online, because tonight is really an important session, because it to me, forgiveness and living in forgiveness is so, so important. Because when we step out of forgiveness, it gives the tormentor an opportunity to um, torment us. And 
I know that his kingdom is peace and righteousness and joy. And that's what I want to live in every day. So we learned um, at the very beginning, we um, just learn about who is the son of, who is the son of God? Who is God? We learn about his nature and his characteristics, and we learn about the enemy's nature and the enemy's characteristics, and we learn through discernment to be able to know um, who, who we're listening to. And we learn that we have many, many thoughts in our life and that we don't have to agree with our thoughts, nor do our thoughts have to become our identity. And I, so we, we learn about that in discernment. And then we learn about um, the accuser and, so, and what is sin. And that, is, and that it's um, very basic, and that is, is that there is no gray area. There is God's kingdom, and there's an enemy's kingdom, and there's no gray kingdom. So either you're, you're either living your life every moment of every day, building God's kingdom, furthering his kingdom, or you're sowing into the enemy's camp. And you are um, living in torment, in the, living in the enemy's camp. And so we have enough, we have, this, this lifestyle is a way to have freedom in any situation that you are involved in. And so Janice taught last week on accusing, um, on accusing spirits, and they remind me a little bit of the Alaskan mosquito. You don't always see them, but you always hear them. And so I wanted, so, and she told me that she used, this is our visual that we use with our children when we teach children's church. Janice and I get to teach children's church sometime. And we get to show children that there is an accuser and that we can swat those nasty little gnats away. We may not see them, but we can hear them and we know they're around us. And that we, God has given us the tools to be able to overcome and to take all of any kind of accusing thought that's coming at us, we can just swat it. So my question is, which I love is testimony, and so I want to know about your testimony and any way that you swatted the accuser this week and would love to hear that from anybody I would like to share. Hi, Sean. talked about that and uh, went through it and it's putting that into my daily life now it's like okay yeah this is this is not something that I need to keep replaying in my head mm -hmm. time and time again mm -hmm. it's like you know Lord please like let's get rid of this thought let's get rid of this mm -hmm. thing that's constantly being repeated to myself mm -hmm. you know like That is repeating, it's repeating over and over in your mind. Yeah. 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 Good word. Yeah. yeah. That's the revelation of understanding that when we have a thought, that we can take that thought captive. We do not have to agree with that thought. Not only that, but we can turn the thought around and use God's word to come against any kind of thought that is not from his kingdom. And I love what Sean is talking about because the freedom of, of saying no to our thoughts and not dwelling on them because our brain, when we dwell on a thought or something that's happened to us that had pain in it, and if we dwell on that and we relive it, we're going to talk about that tonight, that it's as if our brain does not recognize that it hasn't happened again. And we go through the whole chemical makeup of what has happened to us. And so it's super important to say no to that, right? We do not want to relive the pain of our past. We don't want to relive any kind of negativity in us at all. Robert, do you want to share? Well, I had a thought. It was not so much getting rid of the bad one. Uh, it was addressing the life spirit, and it was on 
the Sabbath of Saturday, when uh, time was taken uh, to do Sabbath activity between Janice and myself, we, uh, at least I was, particularly and metabolically blessed during that morning and during the day. It's like, wow, this is a, this is a spiritual thing here. Mm -hmm. Doing a Sabbath thing and being aware of it—it mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't that hard. You just had to do it, right? Right. right. And there was a benefit to it. Yeah. So that's that's testimony. That's testimony. You know, of spiritual things, it really is. That's the um, Sean and Robert. The two things that they said that they that are in common is obedience, and that uh, Robert and Sean, as they walked out. Sean with his thoughts, Robert with the Sabbath, and Janice, that that's God's heart, that as we walk out obedience, that he gives us a blessing and that we feel his presence. And there's nothing. You can't buy um, his blessings, and you can't buy peace. You, you cannot go to the store. You cannot get it. it is only, it's only something supernatural. So come on in, Paul. Oh, okay. So out of Proverbs 19.11, I just share this as I was getting ready for the lesson this week. I love this. A wise man restrains his anger and overlooks insult. This is to his credit. And that reminds me of like a bank, that we all are a bank, and that as we overlook any kind of an offense or irritation or say no to it, then we get credit. And we're getting ching, ching, credit in the bank. But our credit is heavenly, heavenly, um, heavenly money that we that we get to build up our credit, right, from our God. And so tonight, I want you to be thinking about that. And I want you to be thinking about um, what that means in your own life, how to overlook an insult or overlook um, an, uh, any kind of an offense. So. Um, when I talk about bitterness, bitterness is the root of all unloving spirits. And so when we operate or we notice that that is happening in our world and as we are, are observing it, especially right now in the way that things that are happening in our world, that, um, that when we see that operating, that that is the root of all unloving spirits. And it is the same especially in Alaska as the root of a dandelion. You can go out into your yard and you can um, have a whole bunch of dandelions in your yard and you can cut them off, but they will grow back quickly. And the only way that you can get rid of that dandelion is to get to the root. And so that's what uh, God wants us to do. He wants us to get to the root of what's going on, you know, in our hearts. So when we don't forgive or dwell on hurtful events or situations, um, grudges or resentments or any of those types of things, uh, bitterness can take root and it can become um, a foothold and then it can become a stronghold, okay? And it can take over your yard. It can take over your soul um, just like dandelions do in the yard, okay? In my past, I know that I told God that I was willing to forgive certain things in my life that um, had happened to me, but there were things in my life that I was not willing to forgive. And because I chose that and I compartmentalized that, I thought I could do that, but in God's kingdom, you cannot compartmentalize forgiveness. Um, because one, in any area where there's not forgiveness, it affects every other area of your life. And so the one area that I said that I would not, that took me a long time to forgive was that the situation in my first marriage that happened. I was very angry and I was very bitter. And um, I will just tell you that it doesn't look really pretty on you. And so I wasn't looking real pretty for many years and I held a lot of bitterness. And I didn't realize that my bitterness would affect my relationship with my children, that it would re affect my relationship with my family, but it did. And I thought that I had a right to be, um, I, thought, I felt I had a right not to forgive because of what had happened to me. Okay, so um, hallelujah, 
When I came here, I learned how to truly, truly forgive. And um, I learned, um, one of the things that I learned was one of the books that Art Matthias wrote is In His Own Image on how negative emotions <coughs> affect our health and suppress our immune system. And I'm thankful that I learned that because I know when I came here, I was walking around with a lot of junk in my trunk and I knew that I had created my immune system to be vulnerable to other things around me. And so I learned that, it, that the bitterness, start, Art talks about this in his book, that bitterness starts in the thought process of our thought life. And it is a negative emotion which can affect our health and our emotional health and our physical health. So for me, walking around like that, holding grudges, being bitter, um, living in rejection, um, speaking um, words of death in situations, um, speaking curses over people, all of those parts um, affected my immune system and it lowered it so I knew that, I would, that after I went through the chemo, I knew that um, that was one of the pieces that I didn't want to have in my life anymore. That I didn't want my immune system to be compromised. I wanted my immune system to be strong. And that I, what I needed to do is I needed to renew my mind. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit. And I learned how to renew my mind. But I, because of my diagnosis, I knew I needed to do something fast. So I found some scripture on healing and I read it into my phone and I listened to it all night long because I needed to have his word embedded in my heart because it says in the word that when we're in trouble that that his word will save us and so and I didn't have his word in me right um, so I knew that I needed to have that and I was on a journey to live to it was I will tell you that to have that kind of a diagnosis to me was beautiful in, a, in the sense of that I knew that I might meet my maker, that I might meet God face to face, that I might meet him. And what did I want him to say to me? And I was so thankful that I had the opportunity to do a reset. What made you fight? What made me fight for my life? What made me fight for my life? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, what made me fight for my life was my, um, um, the love of, because I love God, I loved him so much, I wanted to live. And I wanted to live for him because of what he did for me. And so I didn't, I, um, when I went through it, Christy, it was like this huge emotion of his love. Like I could feel his love penetrate all the darkness in me. And that his love, I knew, I could feel his love in the darkness. And I could feel his love in all of the sickness. Like I could feel his love and that, and that I had hope. That regardless of what the end was going to look like, that he is for me and that he loves me. And that... I had salvation in him. And I wanted to be, a, so that's what drove me. Was that, was my love, was his love for me. So the opposite of that, which negative emotions can affect our health and suppress our immune system, is what words can do. That pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. So our immune system is, fo is formed in the marrow of the bones, and I learned that when I came here. And so I learned that my words had the power of life and death. And I, if that is something I, that I want to be reminded of every day, that my words have the power of life and death. And if I could communicate that in a way, like if we really, really could grasp that, that what we say over ourselves, what we say over others, that it's important. I said it to um, somebody I was on the phone with who was having some struggles and she was just having a really hard time. And um, anyway, so we were, she would just kept t talking about all of these things about herself in such a real negative way. And I told her, I said, I want you to understand. So we 
sealed the words so that the enemy couldn't use it in any way. And I said, I want you to think about you that you have God on in front of you and you have the enemy in front of you. And there is a, there are two demonic an angelic beings, one on each shoulder of the enemy. And there are, there are two angelic beings on one on each of God's shoulders. And as you speak those words, as you speak them, they both have um, angelic beings ready for assignment. And as you speak those words, they will go out and they will match those words. They will, they will make, they will, um, they will put into place in a spiritual way that you don't even know about, that you don't even know about. And so um, our words are very, very important. Okay, and so we're going to look at what happens when we live in that type of state. And I want you to think about this diagram. It's, um, it's a diagram that's created by doctors. It's, a, it's, a, it's adaptive stages that we all go through when we are living life. And God wants us to live in the blue, that peace and the homeostasis. But he has created us with emotion. And he's created us with um, the fight and flight. He's created us, us with adrenaline and cortisol because he knew that we were going to need to have that in different times of our life. So those are, our emotions are important, are powerful, they're important, and they're good. So God created them, they're really good. The enemy wants to use them to try to create um, havoc in our life. And so the enemy wants us to live in that cortisol, in that fight or flight all of the time. God wants us to recognize it and take it to him for him to let, to let, him help us with this, to bring us back down to um, peace, to bring us back down into the homeostasis area where he wants us to be. So sometimes when we move into that type of area, into the resistance and the ongoing stressors in our cortisol, and we live that out, it can become our normal. It can feel like this is normal. This is a normal way of life. And that's how I lived for a quite a few years of my life. I lived in that really high adrenaline, fear state, and um, excitement, all of that, that danger. I lived in that state for a long time. And so um, it took me a long time to figure out what God's normal felt like, what God's peace felt like. And when I first started on that journey with that, it didn't, it didn't feel normal when I started on that. So... Um, so it's, it's um, God's way that he wants us to say, okay, he wants to give us that homeostasis and that, and that peace. One of the things that, one of the doctors that we listen to and we follow is Dr. Caroline Leaf. And she says that 75 to 95% of the illnesses that um, we are plagued with today are a direct result of our thought life. Or we call them toxic thoughts. So I, th I thought about that and I thought, you know, when you go to a doctor, in the doctor's office, if you just go to a regular doctor, they are aware that 75% of the patients are coming in with a stress-related situation, right? So um, during my journey, one, one of the things that happened is when I, go through, when I went through my, and I still go, I have blood work done. And there's been times when my blood work hasn't come back good. And they have said to me, you know, hey, you know, we want to do some more blood work. I know they're, they're looking for cancer. And I have said to them, you know what? I need a month, give me a month and I'll come back. And I take a journey, me and my husband, and we go, and I go through and I ask God, God, can you show me? Show me any ways in me that I have picked up, um, any bitterness where I've picked up anything that is creating havoc in my body. Show me what kind of foods I'm eating. Show me, am I, am I, honoring, my, am I honoring my vessel well with the foods I'm putting in my body? Am I staying in peace? And I will tell you that the times that I've come back and done that, every time my blood work has come back perfect, you know, because today I know how to, I know how to use what God has given me in living out um, forgiveness, living out repentance, and that his ways are perfect. And he has what he has for me, he has for everyone. So um, he doesn't want us to stay in any 
component in any way that would create any kind of disease in us or keep us in the cortisol, which um, is not good for our body if we have too much of it. it says in 3 John 1, 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And our soul are our thoughts, our feelings, and our choices. And so um, when I learned that, that, um, that I have feelings, I have thoughts, and I have choices, and that God has given me everything I need to be able to um, say yes to my choices, that I have the power for that, I can say yes to righteousness and no to unrighteousness, and I learned all that when I came through here. So some of the things that happen in us through when we live in that flight or sort of the cortisol, one of the other ways that I think about it is we have a conscious and we have a subconscious. And we operate many times out of our subconscious. And so have you ever wondered where a feeling or emotion came from? So we can be triggered today by something that happened years ago. So there was a scientist, his name was Pavlov. And he did, a, he did a test with dogs. And uh, he did something, and he named it classical conditioning, where he exposed a dog to food, and then the dog would um, salivate, and then he added ringing of a bell. And then he noticed that even if the dog even heard the footsteps of the scientist, the dog's bowl, um, that the animal would start to respond to it. And so memories are not just pictures in our minds. They are formed according to the context and the state of mind at the time that the original memory was formed. And so that's why if you smell something, it can take you way back to your childhood. Have you guys ever had that where you get a smell and it takes you back to your childhood? Um, if you enter in, or if you go into a certain place of town or you go to a, you know, uh, a certain area, you'll start to have a memory that comes back to you. So maybe a favorite food um, might immediately take you back. So that also, I also think about things like trauma that has happened in people's lives. When they go back to, this, to the place where the trauma happens, they remember it. They can start to physically feel what has happened to them because um, the, the memories are embedded in us and they come at the time, their memory is formed at the time it, it happened. And it comes through uh, smell and it comes through what we see. One of the best ways for me to explain that is after I went through surgery, um, during my journey, I had to have this ointment put on my body so that my skin wouldn't turn black. And so anyway, so <clears throat> the ointment, I was, you know, I was like, okay, they get, told me everything that was gonna happen. Dave had to put on plastic gloves to put the ointment on me because it couldn't get into his skin. And they just told me I would go in like a three hour deep, dark pain, that there would be like this deep, dark pain for like three hours. And so he put the ointment on me and I'd go into the deep, dark pain for three hours. And so anyway, so one day he comes, one time he comes, I'm in the bed and he comes to the, to the, uh, door and he starts to walk through the door and I look at him with the gloves on and the ointment and I just start to cry because I know what's going to happen. So um, I had classical conditioning. I had been conditioned that if he puts this ointment on me, this is what this is going to do to my body. And so we all have had, we've all been conditioned by our memories. Um, there, so there's been experiments done on classical conditioning. There's been, I loved coming here. I loved being equipped. So when I would go to the doctor that I would enter into the parking lot and I would sing praises to him and I would have an expectancy of good. And I learned that women and men going in for appointments that had to do with any kind of cancer that they tested their immune systems before and after and that they were affected. So even going in to this doctor or going into the situation, um, it can make you sick. And I think our minister too, that uh, we've have a couple of stories where like going, you know, children that have been to the hospital for a lot of times when they get older, um, going into the hospital makes them sick because of what has happened to them. They've been conditioned from their past, right? 
And so because of that, that's an awareness that we can be conditioned from our past. We can be conditioned in memories that have happened to us. Well, because of that, um, I want you to know that God can renew us. He can renew and he can heal us from any conditioning that has happened to us. And he forgives us, right? It says in Exodus 34, 7, that I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. So any ways that we have been conditioned, any ways that we have lived out, living a life that has not been his ways, that this is what he does. He forgives. He forgives us. And when he forgives us, he lavishes his unfailing love to a thousand of our generations. How beautiful is that? Lavish means to bestow something in generous or extravagant quantities. So our God gives us extravagant quantities of lavish of his unfailing love. Janice says it like it's like double, double frosting being smeared all over us. That that's how much he lavishes. He lavishes us so much when we come to him and ask him to forgive us that he's faithful and loves a thousand of our generations. He forgives our iniquity, our rebellion, and our sin. But he does not excuse the guilty, right? And it says, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and their grandchildren, and the entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations, okay? So I know that in my family generation, there was such violence that it was called blackout. And so um, that was the sin of one of my grandparents, right? And guess what? It affected him, and it affected his children, and it affected my generation, right? Now, um, my mom said, not anymore, not in my generation. And she stopped it. I said in my generation, I'm going to stop this. And I chose to stop a certain, certain behaviors that I knew were destructive. And I said, no more for my future generations. So we live with our choices. But our God says, you know what? I love you in all of it. And I'm going to give you the power to be able to stop the generational curses in you and in your children and in their children through the power that I have given you. Okay, Robert, you're going to say something? Yeah, there's a phrase up there, of course my dying so I do not excuse the guilty, and that just jumped off the screen at me here. The, the one right above it is I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Mm -hmm. uh, given the topic here, uh, the ones who are whatever guilty are, are the ones who, who do not live in the, re the commandment of forgiveness right. and repentance. repentance. And if, you, if I do not, for anything, uh, have a confession and a repentance and a Request and then receiving for forgiveness. If I don't do that, then I am guilty. Guilty. Mm -hmm. So that word guilty, uh, you know, if you grow up in American or British systems, guilty is a judgment term. It's with courts. Uh, however, that it relates to your your soul uh, is what I'm learning here. Mm -hmm. It's good work. That's a good word, yeah. He forgives it all. He forgives us all. He does not want us. He doesn't excuse. He doesn't give. We, we don't have excuses for what we've done, and he doesn't excuse it, but he doesn't want us to live in shame or guilt or condemnation. He wants us to move away from that when we ask and say to him, forgive me. I actually talked to somebody I love very much on the phone and uh, was praying with them, and they said, you know, man, I just want to tell you that um, 
I just know that my God does not want me living in things that are not good for me. And you know, I, I just was doing a lot of pot smoking. I was smoking a lot of pot. But every time I would smoke pot, I'd feel guilty and ashamed. And I realized, you know what? My God doesn't want me to feel guilty and ashamed. So you know what I did? I stopped doing it. Stop doing it. Well, that's some, that's some words of wisdom right there. <laughs> because if you, when we engage in things that create that, God says, hey, I have a different way for you. I have a different way for you. And I love that because this is a person who is very young and is already practicing for, uh, repentance. He's already practicing that. So our God wants us to practice what he gives us, which is forgiveness. He wants us to live that out. He wants us, he wants to give us in our generations and a, th- our, and a thousand generations his unfailing love. He wants to do that for us. We have a part in that. It says right here, for God has not given us the spirit of fear and timidity, which when I looked it up is lack of courage. He's not given us a lack of courage. He's not given us fear, but he's given us a spirit of power and of love and of <clears throat> a self-discipline. And sometimes you might hear it as um, a sound mind. Okay. So he has given us what we uh, need in order to live out that lifestyle. And we can't do it without his power. And he's helped us to have courage. All right? He wants us to practice it, what he has done for us. Because it says a person in Proverbs 25, 28, without self-control, which is self-discipline, is like a house with its doors and windows knocked out. Okay? So if our doors and our are blown out, if our windows and doors are blown out of our house, which is our vessel, we will have nowhere to knock on a door for help. And God will not be able to knock on our door so that we can let him in. Because we won't, we won't have anything. We'll be completely empty. All right. In Matthew 7, it says um, for us to knock, that there's many verses in the word that talk about being a door. In John 10, it says, Yeshua, I am the door. Yeah. I'm sorry. You, you mentioned the, um, accusing spirits and uh, the spirits being like mosquitoes. If your doors and windows are up, you have a house full of mosquitoes. <laughs> hey, you're good. You're just, there's no screens, there's no nothing. You've got the spirit. And I think that's what that verse is saying, too. Yeah. Oh, you're going to say the same thing, John? Any vermin can come in. Yeah. 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 When we lived in Tennessee, a tree fell in our house, and uh, the roof was open for a month, and we had lots of things living inside of us. Oh, a lot of vermin, huh? It was in the middle of August. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah. Great. All kinds of things. You know, yeah. Snakes. But anyway, that's why windows and doors being blown out. Yeah. It's such a terrible Yeah. Yeah, when we, you know, doors and windows keep us safe, right? They keep us safe, and God wants us to keep the doors and the windows of our hearts safe. He does not want us um, to be, we don't, he doesn't want our windows and doors blown out because then anything can come in, right? And we don't want, we, we do not want that. We want, and I love, I just have to say this, it's, it's about timidity, the lack of courage. Um, my grandson came over. And um, he came to the house, and I'm going to talk about courage. And so anyway, so he comes in, and he comes in yesterday, and he's got his lunchbox, and he tells us that he didn't have time to eat his lunch. And so we're, we start questioning him. What do you mean you didn't get to eat your lunch? Well, you know, we were just really, and so he starts to tell us about this lesson and about how the teacher didn't give him any time to eat his lunch. And so I'm like, really, because listen, I may be contacting your teacher. I may be emailing your teacher. I want to know exactly why you didn't have time to eat your lunch. And, and grandpa's like, it is not okay that you did not get to eat your lunch, right? So my honey goes to the bathroom and my grandson says, grandma, grandma, um, really? Um, what happened was I, I had hot lunch, but I didn't get to eat much. I said, 
okay, well, why did you have hot lunch? Well, I, I, I kind of left my lunchbox in the truck. Oh, okay, so you forgot your lunchbox and you went ahead and got hot lunch, but you only got to eat two pieces of pineapple. But you didn't want grandpa, I, yeah, I just didn't want grandpa to know I left my lunchbox in the, in the truck. I don't want him to be mad at me. And I said, okay, well, listen, do you, you're gonna, you're gonna need to tell him, no, 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 grandma, you tell him. I said, listen, this is gonna take courage. Listen, but you've started talking about something that wasn't true, and you've kind of started to make up a story, but listen, you stopped yourself, and you're gonna have the courage, and I'm gonna go with you, or you're gonna go by yourself, and you're gonna do that. And he goes, well, will you come with me? And so I went with him, and in his courage, he told the truth. Right? He told the truth. And that's, that, I love that story because he doesn't have, that's the enemy wanting him to make up a whole bunch of stories so that he doesn't get in trouble because he doesn't want his grandpa to be mad at him because he's afraid. So that's that fear, right? But he used his courage to come out and to be honest and tell his grandpa and say, will you forgive me for being dishonest with you? And it, was, it all ended up really good. But that example um, is very important. I am counseling with a woman right now who has, has a very serious, like when she goes into a situation, she feels like she um, has a meltdown. And so I've helped her through God and through prayer we set up her goal we set up her vision what's your vision what do you want and so she would go into this situation it was a medically related she'd go into a medical situation and she would have a meltdown a middle the middle of the way through it she would start to have a lot of anxiety and it just it just didn't go well and then she came back out of it and then we prayed about it she would forgive herself and then she'd go back in and then she'd get almost all the way to the end. And I got, to, I got to talk with her, and it's just an amazing testimony because she had a medical procedure done, and she slept through it. Because she had a vision and a goal of what she wanted, and she practiced what Sean talked about, taking her thoughts captive, saying, um, you know, going into the situation, saying, you are with me. I do not agree with these thoughts. Thank you, God. You are powerful. You are with me. And she, God helped her to advocate for herself, and she came out um, victorious and as an overcomer. And so instead of that fear, she used God's power, and she used her self-control in order to do that. And I love that in the self-control because it's out of Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit, that as we are living out our life, you know, are we seeing, are we living in peace? Do we have love? Do we have joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, right? And that's, and that's who, um, that's, that's the fruit of uh, the Spirit, and, we, and he wants us to be practicing that. So what I want to do is, um, and he wants to be, us to be practicing that, practicing that through forgiveness. And so what I want to do is I want to lead you through a prayer if you want to follow along with me, but I want to go through a generational, I want to break generational sin and curse of bitterness in your life and in all of your generations, okay? All right, so um, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, in Yeshua's name, I confess and repent of the sin of bitterness in my life and in all my generations. And in Yeshua's name and by the power of his blood, I cancel all of Satan's power and authority over me. And I command all the tormentors and unclean spirits that have been assigned to me because of the generational sin and curse of bitterness to leave me now and never return. Heavenly Father, I ask you to place the cross between me and bitterness. Heavenly Father, I ask you to place the cross between me and bitterness. 
That bitterness will stop at your cross in the name of Yeshua. Father, please cleanse my conscience with the blood of Christ. Please cleanse my conscience with the blood of Christ. From all of the guilt, shame, and dead works that I operated in in bitterness, that I might serve the living God. Father, heal my broken heart and show me your truth to set me free. anybody like to share? <coughs> what he's saying to you? Any thoughts that you have? shouldn't be doing that all day long. All day Eventually long. it's going to catch you. Mm -hmm. And just being good when that can get it does. lightened. It does. It, uh, the weight is gone. Is that good? Yeah, what I learned when I first came here <clears throat> through the prayers, because I had done counseling for over 20, for a long time in my life, when I came here and I started going through the prayers, uh, like the prayer that I just went through with you guys, I could feel peace. And that's what I said a lot. I, I, I feel peace. And my counselor said, you can feel that all day long. And I'm like, oh, sign me up. Sign me up. That regardless of what is happening, that I can have that weight off of me, I can live in peace. Right? That's what he wants for us. So we can do the catch. We can change our very DNA, that we can alter our brain anatomy and our genetics expressions, we do that. And we can do that in a positive or negative way and it happens through our choices. It happens in our choices, it happens in the words we speak, and in our actions. And that we play a very vital role in that. We we play a very, very important role in that, and that is entirely up to us, right? Okay? When, when we go through a journey, we can have that goal that we want to honor our God well. We want to have a testimony for Him, right? We, we get to choose that. We can choose to... to be angry. We can choose to be depressed about it. We, you know, we ha our choices are so powerful. It's one of the most beautiful gifts that God has given us is free choice. And and we can choose to live out a different way. God has a different way, and I love it because it's not about our feelings, right? Our feelings catch up with us. It's. It's not about that because our feelings go up and down like when you get on an elevator, right? Our feelings change. They're real, but they're not always true. 
but that it's God's ways that are true, and he wants us to, he wants us to walk in him. He wants um, us to renew our minds, and he's given us that power to catch our thoughts. I believe it's we get a three-second, Genesis at three seconds, response. When, when our thoughts come, we have a three-second response on how we want to respond to it. It's a minute. Okay. Could be a minute. Could be a minute, but we, it's three minutes. So we, so we have three. It's, so we actually have, if you sat alone quietly in time, three minutes, that's a long time. So we, you know, God has given us that power. He's given us three minutes to respond, right? And that you don't have to react, that you can respond right and as we respond we can change our genetic expression right we can completely alter um, our brain anatomy because every time we choose and respond his ways we create a new a new a new pathway like all of that stuff that's in your subconscious things that have happened to you as you place them with new neural pathways his ways, it takes, it, it builds in your subconscious. It replaces all of that old stuff, all that negativity, all those ways that you used to think, all the ways that you used to hold grudges against people, okay? It replaces that, okay? I love that because I am not a victim of my past and I'm not a victim of my present or future, and guess what, neither are the people around me. We all get, we all get to choose that. So his answer is, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, all right? And in Hebrews 9, it says the, the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from acts that lead to death, right? That he actually does that for us. So in Romans 12, I'm going to back up. It says, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. And so not that automatic response, okay? And embracing that what is happening in your life, what is God, that God is doing something for you. And I love what Robert says, God is not doing something to you, he's doing something for you. He's wanting in my pain in your pain in our disappointment in our all of our life situation God is using it for us to grow us and to move us into maturity in him okay you'll be changed from the oh I love this don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking instead fix your attention on God you'll be changed from the inside out Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in, in you. And that's out of the message. So he wants us not to be conformed to the pattern of this world. Of this world. He wants us to renew our mind. And so he wants us to recognize what kind of patterns do you have that are not from him. What type of cycles are in your life or habits or thoughts that you keep going back to and or attitudes that, you know, that he wants you um, to break, that he wants you to break and, um, and to do things um, his way. So he, it says in Hebrews 9, 11, to purge. The blood of Jesus cleanses or purges our conscience of any unwanted feeling, memory, or condition. Okay? I'm going to back up a little bit because this is so beautiful. If 
that animal blood and the other rituals of purification were effective in cleaning up certain matters of, matters of our religion and behavior, just think how much more the blood of Christ cleans up our whole lives, inside out. Through the Spirit, Christ offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice, freeing us from all the dead end efforts to make ourselves respectable, respectable so that we can live all out for God, so that his, that is his answer. So the renewing of your mind is taking those thoughts captive and using God's word and, and declaring that out loud, that um, the blood of Jesus cleanses my mind, cleanses my conscience from any act that would lead me to death. And I declare that, that I am a woman of Hebrews 9, 4. And so you declare that, I speak that out loud. And so it is in the renewing of our mind. It's a scientific fact and a physical reality. And there's no expiration date on our potential because our brain never wears out. It gets better if you use it. So he wants us to fix our thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So I love, um, when it, I just can talk to you about some of my friends. One of my friends I spent a lot of time with and we were doing some cooking in the kitchen together and she just has a way of doing things and they're not my way. And so, but we flowed in that and um, she said to me, you know, I'm just really glad that you're so accepting and that you don't get offended with the way I want to do things. And I said to her, you know what? I'm really glad that we are living out a relationship together of forgiveness and repentance and that we do not become offended. Now, there were multiple things I could have, be, I could have gotten irritated and offended with. Many, right? But what I did was I said, how does God see my friend? What does God say about the truth about my friend? Not what I see, not what I say. What does God say? I could say that, you know, in some of my friendships that some people, you know, are, have a lot of anger or they get, um, or they want to talk bad about people. But what does God say about them? That's what God wants me to think about about that person. And I love my friend, one of my friends who says, you know what, I'm not going to listen to any third parties. I'm only going to be listening to what I see and what I'm observing. I'm not going to believe what third parties say to me. It's my girl, Kenda. So he wants us to think about things that are excellent and worthy and praiseworthy because you know what? That's how he thinks about me. Right? He forgives me. He forgave me. He forgave me first. He wants me to live out that forgiveness. And how did he see me? Right? He saw the truth about me. He saw the pure... The, the loveliness about me. He saw the honoring in me. And that's what he spoke, and that's what God did for me. And that's what he wants me to do for other people. So as we... Um, yeah, so, wanna, you want to add something? I'm at, yeah, Go ahead. I'm uh, connecting the, um, the verse about the, uh, the, the Proverbs 25, 28 with this... Philippians 4, 8, is that if you don't have doors and windows in your house, you're not going to be able to do that. In other words, if you're, <laughs> if you're not self-disciplined, you're not going to be able to fix your thoughts on what is admirable. So it really requires that amazing gift of self-discipline. Of self-discipline. One of the things um, um, that I has been going on in myself has been going back and really retuning the difference between observation and opinion. Mm -hmm. And what? Opinion. And so, especially in some of my relationships, that I can observe what's happening in, or what this person is doing, but once I put in my opinion, it leads me to judging. 
which leads me to being tormented by the enemy. And so I've been practicing that observation, you know, just making statements of observations instead of giving my opinion. Because you know what? I, honestly, I get, you know, I can get hooked into that, and I don't want to live in that. I don't want to be tormented in that. And it is simple. It is a very simple equation: observing only without my opinion. Because once I give it, I've made that judgment. And if it's not a godly judgment. You know, um, if it's not something that is lovely, right, honorable, or admirable about that person, then that opinion <coughs> is not is not good. I'm thinking that that's why I have to choose my words. Yes. With thoughtfulness or carefully, whatever, but thoughtfully. You don't have to be careful around things, but you have to be thoughtful. Right. So that it's accurate. Yeah, so that it's accurate. Right. The spiritual event. Um, you know, looking into somebody and living that lifestyle of like pulling out their gold, pulling out what you know, the identity that God has put in that person, doesn't, it just has nothing to do with what they're doing or what you're seeing. It's what you know is in them. Because people pulled the gold out of me. People did that for me because they were uh, they were walking beside me and they were helping me. And there's t we we when we change our minds, it changes our identity. Okay, from the inside out, not the other way around. There's 20. I, when I did some research, there's 23 verses about having the mind of Christ. 21 places in the Bible with what we are to do with our thoughts. Seven verses about the power of our thoughts. 20 verses about renewing the mind, but guess what? 90 verses about our identity. About our identity. What is our identity? How do we see ourselves? Because God loves, lavishly loves us. Do you have a compilation of what those verses are? are? <laughs> no, I don't. No, no, I, I, no, I don't. <laughs> That that'll have to be something. Maybe I will go back and I will and I will research. Yeah. Oh, okay. That sounds great. Okay. So God wants us to do that. Now, sometimes we can get hooked. Sometimes we can get a little irritated with people, and we want to bring them down. And, um, but I will tell you that. You know, in the wrestling match, God doesn't want us to pin down a human being. <laughs> he doesn't want us to physically grab him and pull him down, right? He doesn't want us to do that because that's not our fight. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and against the rulers of the darkness, right, of the world. But when we move into opinions about people, then we will want to, put, we will want to bring, pull him down. We will want to pin him in a wrestling match. The word strongholds um, is found once in the New Testament, and it's used metaphorically by Paul in a description of the Christian spiritual battle. A stronghold is something strong that holds you down. God does not want us to be held down. He wants us to uh, renew our mind, and he wants us to understand exactly uh, who we are wrestling against. So sometimes we think we're wrestling against a person, but it's not against the person. It's not against the system, right? It's not about a stronghold that's been in place for many years in our family or generationally. It's a spiritual wrestle. And we rule differently than what our reaction wants to be or the way that we've been taught. And so, and I've, I have learned that very um, personally in my life, that I can be with people that I love, that I care about, and I can be with them, and I, and I can look at them and love them, but I do not have to wrestle with them. That I can um, do what Robert said, I can have very little to say. I can make observations 
And then as I am around them, I have watched the transformation of God working in them instead of me trying to tell them what they, they've done that's wrong. So I don't come up against them. It's not my responsibility to do that. It's my responsibility to love them and to um, walk in um, forgiveness at any time that I, need, that I need to with them. So the principalities and powers, this is a diagram that we use. I really truly believe this, that this is the way that temptation can come to us. It's where we do not want to forgive other people. We want to beat them up. Or where we want to beat ourselves up. Um, that we want to compare and compete um, with what's around us. Or we, uh, rejection. Today I was actually doing, um, I was actually, I actually, even though I do teach and even though I do ministry, I also go to tune-ups. And so I was in a tune-up today. And um, I know that when rejection happened in my life, and I know what happened when the spirit of rejection was what was opened up in my life as a child. And I learned what that looked like in my life. And I came against generational rejection and curses that I lived out in my life. And so um, my heart is, is that I want to be completely a vessel of honor for God. And I want to get rid of everything that um, is holding that back. I do not, I want to be used um, for, for our God. Okay, so we can have, you know, there is a principality, there's an enemy, he's got dom dominions, he's got demonic influence, and he tempts us um, through um, what we see, what we hear, and what we talk about. So in Hebrews 12, 15, bitterness is described in what he wants us to do and how he wants us to respond. This is what he wants, God wants. He wants us to look at, he wants us to look after each other. He wants, relate, he wants us to have relationship with one another. He wants us to be in a community. He wants us to have friendship. He wants us to look out for each other, okay, so that none of us fail to receive his power and to watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble us or our friendships or other people because when it grows up in us, then it corrupts us and it will create others. It, inf it has an effect on other people. And it can have that effect for other people and how they walk out their life. In Hebrew, I reread about it and listened to Pat teach about it in the Torah, that in Hebrew, bitterness means mar, which is, um, and the M in mar means chaos, and R means the head. So in Hebrew, Bitterness means chaos in the head. So when we're walking and holding a record of our people's wrongs in our family or in our, at our job or in our church, that we, it creates chaos in our head. And That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and um, yeah, that's what it does. <laughs> and I love that because God brings up situations and memories that what happened to us in our day because he doesn't want us carrying that junk around he wants us to get rid of it right he has his way the world's going to continue the work's going to continue relationships are going to continue but he wants us to walk in that freedom so when bitterness knocks on your door, you don't have to open it, okay? We can say, nope, my room is full of God's love. I ain't got no room for you in this room. If we say yes, come on in, I'm going to actually think about those thoughts and think about all the things that that person did wrong today or what they said. I'm going to chew on it. I'm going to talk to myself about it. I'm going to talk to someone else about it. And then the root, like the dandelion, will grow quickly in us, okay? 
So the best way to destroy it is one memory at a time. So we're going to talk about those, these enemies and these little accusing spirits. And in Luke 11, 24 through 26, it says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return unto my house where I came from. And when he came, he found it swept and garnished. Then he goeth and he take it, brings to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> this tells us it's very important that when we sweep at our house and we get rid of all of that, junk that is we what are we going to put into it okay what are we going to furnish our house with that's really really super important okay unclean spirits which is um do not have physical bodies so they're seeking anyone who is willing to host them they are wanderers they're talked about 21 times in the new testament they are spirits that are de are demonic in nature and work out their unholy rebellion influencing people to live out the opposite of God's original design. And there's verses in the Old Testament and in the New Testament about believers that were tormented um, and faced demonic attack through unloving spirits. Saul, the daughter of Abraham, um, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, so it can be for all of us, okay? So he, it's, it's important, what are we putting into it? It reminds me of a time when I went over to my daughter's house who called me, who told me that she had a um, uh, ghost in her house. She called me on the phone and said she had ghosts. And I said, and she was super afraid. And I said, well, listen, when you were born, you know, I didn't raise you with fear. You don't have to worry about fear. Can, we, can I come over to your house? And she said, yep. Yeah. So I went over to her house, took my team of prayers, who was available, we went over there and we prayed. She let us pray. Thank you, God. We prayed over her house. We prayed in every room. And she said, I need you to pray specifically in this room. And I said, okay. And then she said, this is where I've heard the noises. This is where I've seen things happen. And she was going to actually move in with us because she was so afraid. So we go over there. We pray. We walk around the building. And my husband says, listen, we have prayed. Now it's your job to keep them out. It's your job to keep them out. And later on, she said, oh, that didn't work because it came back. Because it's her job to keep it out. It's our job to keep it out. We can have somebody pray for us. We can be given a word from God, but it's up to us to keep the house clean. And I said, you know, and I was like, okay, is this really, you know, is she just like saying this? So I had... My husband check it out because he was at the time was working for the police force and I said can you tell me can you check it out and see what happened in this room and somebody actually was killed in that room so you know that sensitivity of the spiritual world that yes there is a spiritual world around us that we can there is demonic influence around us and so anyway so but it was a good lesson for me it's the same as this to me that we can wipe out the house, we can clean out the house, we can, you know, which God wants us to do, but what are we putting in it? What are, we gonna put it? what are we gonna put back? Because if we don't, then it will come back. And sometimes it's more wicked than the other. The that, other that really is an important, and I didn't realize that before, but when, you know, when you're going through all this stuff and, and counseling and learning all the things about my own stuff, replacing the things is where I'm, So good. So, so you know, yeah. Now you go back. How do you do it back? What do you do it? What do you do next? Oh, this is what I. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. You want me to say? We, how about if we just? How about if we do a repentance prayer? Let's do a repentance prayer about that. You want to do that? Okay, Father God. I admit that God, I have been cleaning out my house, and I thank you that you have shown me how to do that. 
Father, I have not been replacing things in my house with godly, holy things. With Holy Spirit, yeah. I have not replaced it with Holy Spirit. Father, forgive me. Father, I thank you so much for your forgiveness. And Father, I forgive myself because you have forgiven me. And I release myself from, from all of the shame, guilt, and condemnation in the dead works that I engaged in when I didn't fill my house with the Holy Spirit. And I ask, Father, that you would replace in me your spirit of truth Father, show me how to fill my house with your strength and your power. Father, I ask that you would wash me with your son's blood. Open the eyes of my heart. Father, give me creative ways. To replace in me what I need. Show me your truth to set me free. Show me your truth to set me Would anybody like to share what he's saying to you? I can remember doing that prayer. He brought me back to before I knew this stuff and before I used this stuff and, be, and at a point where my, my relationships were rocky and horrible. And I can remember I would be saying things out loud start here and then I would start saying anything they didn't even really mm -hmm. believe and pretty soon man I was just like Burr! all over the thing and it's like oh that was it mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah you can physically feel when your soul is in unrest you can physically feel yeah when we do these prayers it's always more physical for me rather mm -hmm. than a thought mm -hmm. and Today I got a visual, and mine was that he, he actually kind of cleared up to me. He said that your discernment is your windows in your home. Without your discernment, everything you get in. You also need the windows to keep that discernment in so your house can be filled. Right. And when I thought of windows, I thought in your case, it was also the roof in your home. That's what discernment is, is protecting you. Yeah. And if you don't 
Yeah, and, amen. Uh, That's a good word. And it's always every, your house is filled with the Holy Spirit. That yes. Your sermon yeah. guides the Holy Spirit. So. It's a good word. It's just, right? yeah. With this sermon, mm -hmm. you call upon the Holy Spirit, and it helps guide you. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's good. Yeah. That's good. Anybody else? What, what came to me while we were praying, and specific to your question, it was a song that came to mind, but it, it, about it only takes a spark to get a fire going, and mm -hmm. all those around can warm up and it's glowing. And so really what it's inviting the Holy Spirit in and getting that spark, and then the, with the windows, with the doors, the warmth and the, the, the Holy Spirit warms everyone and everything around you. Yeah. So, it's good. Yeah, it's good. So what happens when one stronger seizes the house? When a strong man, so that would be bitterness. Okay, so he would be the strong man. And he's armed in our house and he wants to keep his place. Right? His goods are in peace. But when a stronger one, that's our God, that's Yeshua, then he shall come upon him. And that happens through us repenting. That comes through us forgiving. And we can overcome with our strong leader, with our strong Savior. He takes from him all of his armor and he divides his um, spoils. So this is called co-laboring. This is, uh, this is the co-laboring piece that is so, so powerful for us, right? And he wants us to live in that power. So we have, a, we, so the enemy has the principality of bitterness and it comes into seven different pieces of armor and it starts off at, uh, with unforgiveness. So this is how, I'm just gonna take you through it. So it, it's different layers and at each layer it goes, it goes deeper. And you can move like from zero to, you can go from one to seven with murderous words in about five seconds. So it isn't about the amount of time because sometimes you can, it can be explosive, sometimes it, it can be layer after layer in time. But the entry point of bitterness is unforgiveness, okay, towards anybody. So if you get, when, it, when I get bitter I, and I choose not to deal with it, forgiveness. I've said, I've opened the door to forgiveness to unforgiveness. I've opened that door. Unforgiveness comes in, and I've given them a legal, I've now given the tormentors a legal right to torment me. Okay? So I've handed over my deed, of my property, in my house. Then the spirit of bitterness um, takes up residence in my soul, where those are my choices, thoughts, and feelings, and starts to have influence on them. And then bitterness and unforgiveness call on their strong allies, resentment, and then anger for protection. And anger calls his pal hatred, and hatred calls his buddy violence. And verbal and physical violence say, well, let's get physical. Right? And that is when we are cursing and yelling and, and throwing things and hitting things and people. All right? And then violence protects its place by calling in murder. Murderous words the death of marriages and families and actual physical murder. So there is an armor. And so if we see ourselves in any one of those levels, God wants us, we can choose to stay in it, but he wants us to say, hey, I want you to, I want freedom for you. I want you to live out in this. So um, the game of bitterness, you know, those ping pong balls, when you play that game of bitterness, you're going to feel like a ping pong ball. And it says in Galatians 6, 1 through 2, to restore and carry one another's burdens. Um, he doesn't want us to play that ping pong game. He wants us to break down the armor bitterness um, to be his vessel of honor. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about one of my amazing testimonies because this is probably the best one I can talk to about restoring and carrying one another's burdens. This is not about taking on somebody's problems and carrying their load, right? God wants us to take care of our own load, okay? This is not about us telling somebody what they need to do, right? Because that's not going to restore them. So if you talk to somebody who's in, in your life, and they're struggling, 
you telling them what they need to do, they're not going to say, you know, I just never thought of that. I'll take, tell you this with a teenager. Your adult children, you know, you, let's say that you think that they're struggling with something or they're not being very loving or whatever. They're not going to say, oh, you know what, you are so right. I was not being very loving. I think I'll stop doing that. That's usually not going to happen. Well, I had a very broken relationship with my mom, and this is what I love. When we're really broken, then it's such a good opportunity for God to show himself. So I had a super broken relationship with my mom, and uh, I, wanted her to, I wanted her to pay for what she had done to me as a child. And I wanted her to be in pain. And so we had this very tumultuous relationship, and sometimes we wouldn't talk. And then we would get on the phone, and she'd tell me what I had done, and I'd tell her what, what she had done, and then, it'd be, then my body would sweat, and she'd get angry and bring up everything I had done, and I'd bring up everything she had done, and then we'd get off the phone, and it would just happen in this cycle. It was a pattern. It's that pattern that I talked about earlier that God wants, wanted me to break. So when I came here, I said, I want to break every pattern. I want, I want, I, so I didn't, so what I, did, God told me, he didn't tell me his pattern, he just said to me, you need to ask your mom to forgive you for everything that you, you, she says that you've done, and you are not to defend yourself. I learned here that God was my defender, and that it was not up to me to defend myself. So I spent an hour on the phone with my mom. And we went through this cycle of her telling me everything that I had done to her. And I said, Mom, you're right. I did that. Will you forgive me? And there were some things that she said, I don't know if I'll forgive you. And I would say, okay. And so we went through the whole thing, got off the phone, and I was just like, God, you, I co-labored with you, and you helped me. You helped me to stay exactly where you wanted me to be, which is like to take my part in it, Regardless of whether or not I agreed with it or not, this is what, this is what affected her. This is how, what her experience was. And my bitterness and my anger did hurt her. And I had to take responsibility for all of that. She called me two weeks later, I am not kidding you, and was crying on the phone and asked me to lead her through prayers to forgive her mom and dad for physically abusing her as a child that she did not want to carry it around anymore, that it was so painful for her that she wanted that to be gone. And if I would not have been obedient and followed what God told me to do in my part, he couldn't have used me for my mom. So I carried her burden. I talked to her, you know, I started to teach her about forgiveness and repentance, God helped me with that, to restore her to who? To her maker. Because it wasn't about me, it was about her. And about her relationship and her salvation for, for her eternity. And that was one of the most beautiful things that, that happened to me in this journey, when I went through this journey. And I love that because it has taught me how not to become offended I've been taken back on that the last couple weeks to not become offended, to stay in observations without an opinion so I don't go into judgment, and how to forgive. I mean, when you can live out a life of living with people that you love that don't do it your way, and you can accept that, it doesn't mean you agree with it, and you can see their pain and you can live in that forgiveness. It's a very beautiful thing. And that's what the Biblical Foundations of Freedom does, is, is teaches us how to really forgive and how to take those thoughts captive. I think that's a moment for supreme love judging. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll lead you through a prayer. Yeah, yeah, I've done a couple of those today. So, Father God, Father God, I come to you with my free will. I come to you with my free will. And Father, I admit I've been judging. Father, I admit I've been judging. And Lord, I know when I have judged, it has opened the door to bitterness. Lord, I know that when I have judged, I have opened the door to bitterness. Father, I know that it has um, opened the door to the critical spirit. Lord, 
Father, forgive me. Father, because you have forgiven me, I forgive myself. And I release myself of all of the shame, guilt, and condemnation and how I have judged others and how it has produced dead works. In me and in my relationship with you and others. Father, I ask that you would replace in me your spirit of acceptance. Father, strengthen my discernment to know um, when I have moved out of observing and into opinion. Father, wash me with your son's blood and heal my broken heart. Lord, open the eyes of my heart. Renew my mind and give me the mind of Christ. Father, heal my broken heart and show me your truth to set me free. Anybody want to share what Holy Spirit saying to you? He talks to us in all different kinds of ways. Well, I'm going to end our session tonight, our teaching. It's been just an honor to be with you guys and to, and I encourage you to uh, practice your forgiveness <laughs> through your discerner and strengthen that discerner and practice it. So, Father, we love you and we thank you, Father, that you are our God, that your ways are perfect and beautiful and just and trustworthy and we trust you father as we step in and follow your ways father god i pray that you would um, just um, penetrate everyone's mind and their their choices and their feelings and their thoughts father god with your thoughts and lord that you would bless them give them boldness and courage Father God, as they walk this week and walk out tonight, Father God, in talking to you and asking you, Father, to show them what you want them to know. Lord, thank you for this time. Father God, in Yeshua's mighty name, amen.